not be angered by anything in the sermon or offended, but that rather they would take to heart the, the truth, the words of God, the, the true things that are being taught here from the Bible. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I want to focus on a few verses that we read here in Proverbs chapter 22. Look at verse number 6. I'm going to show you about three or four verses that I want to emphasize. The Bible says in verse number 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Boy, isn't that a great promise from the Bible? Isn't that a great promise that God gives us when it comes to child rearing? Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Look down, if you would, at verse number 15. The Bible reads, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. So we see a lot of talk in this chapter about raising your children, training up your children, rearing your children. God says here in verse number 15 that a child is born foolish. Isn't that right? I mean, children aren't born with wisdom, knowing what is right and wrong, knowing how to act, knowing how to live. They must be trained up how they should go, or else the foolishness will rule them. Now, it says here that the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. What's it talking about? It's talking about spankings. It's talking about discipline. It's talking about uh, spanking them with a rod. But then in verse number 8, he says, the rod of his anger shall fail. You see, people who don't use a physical rod to spank their children and to raise their children, what do they use? They use the rod of anger. Right? Think about kids. Think about you're out in public, right? You can tell the people who don't spank their kids because they scream at their kids, right? Parents who don't spank their kids scream at them. Hey, I'd scream at their kids too, the way they're acting. But that's often the alternative. And, and God says it's going to fail. It doesn't work. Yelling at your children is, is never taught in the Bible. It's never helpful to scream at a child. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. Now, well, this is what we're talking about this morning. And before we get into the message, let me give you one more verse. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.10, you don't have to turn there, but just take this to heart. Let this sink down into your ears. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, now, when God makes these kind of superlative statements, He isn't just lightly throwing them out there. When God says all, He means all. And He says in the Bible here, the love of money is the root of all evil. He doesn't say money is the root of all evil. There's nothing bad about money. But He said the love of money is the root cause behind any evil in this world. You can trace it back where money, someone loving money, is involved. We're going to talk this morning, this is the title of my sermon, ADHD is the title of my sermon. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is the title of my sermon, ADD or ADHD. Let me, by way of introduction, read to you something from the National Institute for Mental Health, which is a government agency of the United States of America, okay? NIMH.gov is the website. This is the government's website. This is your tax dollars are putting this website on the internet. This is not information off some kookish website. This is the government's information on ADHD. This is what they say. And uh, bear with me for the first part of the sermon as I read this information. You try and listen carefully. Obviously, it's not as interesting as the Bible. But but it says here, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, parentheses ADHD, is a condition that becomes apparent in some children in the preschool and early years. It's hard for these children to control their behavior and or pay attention. It is estimated that between 3 and 5% of children have ADHD, or approximately 2 million children in the United States. Now remember that figure, okay? They're saying that they're estimating 3 to 5% of all children have this disease of ADHD. And that accounts to 2 million children. Well, that means that in a classroom of 25 to 30 children, it's likely that at least one will have ADHD. Diagnosis. This is how you can make the diagnosis of whether your child has ADHD, according to the government. Some parents see signs of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity in their toddler long before their child enters school. Listen to the first example. The child may lose interest in playing a game or watching a TV show. (laughs) So, this is how you know if your child has ADHD. If they don't want to just sit in front of the TV and watch TV, if they don't want to just sit and rot their brain in front of the garbage that's on TV, if they actually want to get up and go do something, Johnny, sit down and watch the TV and he gets up and wants to go play outside, he may have ADHD. (laughs) Listen to how stupid this is. Some parents see signs of inattention. The child may lose interest in playing a game or watching a TV show. Or may run around completely out of control. 
Not, but because children mature at different rates and are very different in personality, temperament, and energy levels, it's useful to get an expert's opinion of whether the behavior is appropriate for the child's age. Parents can ask their child's pediatrician or a child psychologist or psychiatrist to assess whether their toddler has an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is the government's website, okay? So, uh, Doc, is it normal for my child to run out around out of control or do they have ADHD? <laughs> you know, can you imagine going to the pediatrist? Is this normal? My son runs around out of control screaming. He tears things apart. He breaks things. Is that normal? He won't watch TV. I try to get him to watch TV. I try to put him in front of TV. He won't watch it. Is he, is he normal? No, he's not. He has ADHD. Disorders. Here are some disorders. And this is the introduction to the sermon. Disorders that sometimes accompany ADHD. Tourette syndrome. Who's ever heard of Tourette syndrome? Put up your hand. And this is right off their website. You, you can look at this when you get home. A very small proportion of people with ADHD have a neurological disorder called Tourette syndrome. People with Tourette syndrome have various nervous tics and repetitive mannerisms, such as eye blinks, facial twitches, or grimacing. Others may clear their throat frequently. <laughs> Snort. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't read this without laughing. Snort, sniff, or bark out words. These behaviors can be controlled with medication. <laughs> can you believe this? Uh, they, they bark out words, they snort, they sniff, give them drugs. Okay, listen to this. It says, while very few children have this syndrome, many of the cases of Tourette syndrome have been associated with ADHD. In such cases, both disorders often require treatment that may include medications. Now, you've heard of Tourette syndrome. You've seen people who walk down the street, and I've seen them, these uh, nonviolent offenders in Orangevale, California. They would walk down the street and scream profanity. Have you ever walked in a downtown area and somebody will walk by you just barking and snorting out cuss words one after the other? Just blankety, blank, blank. You will know that if you read the Bible as being demon-possessed. People who are out of their mind blurting out strange things and, and uh, blurting out cursing, they're demon-possessed. They don't have Tourette. Tourette syndrome does not exist. It's called being demon-possessed. Here's another one, and this, this one cracks me up. I, forgive me for laughing. It's not funny, but... It's funny that anybody actually believes this stuff. Oppositional Defiant Disorder. I like this one. ODD. Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Listen to this one. As many as one-third to one-half of all children with ADHD, mostly boys, have another condition known as Oppositional Defiant Disorder. These children are often defiant, stubborn, non-compliant, have outbursts of temper, or become belligerent. They argue with adults and refuse to obey. Duh. That's every child. Yeah. Uh, how about this one? Conduct disorder. This is the next one. About 20 to 40 percent of ADHD children may eventually develop conduct disorder. CD. That's what CD stands for. I was wondering about it. A more serious pattern of antisocial behavior. These children frequently lie or steal, fight, bully others, or get in trouble at school or with the police. They violate the basic rights of other people, are aggressive toward people and animals destroy property, break into people's homes, commit thefts, carry or use weapons, or engage in vandalism. They're not criminals. They just have compliance disorder. They just have conduct disorder. They need drugs is what they need. It says here, these children or teens are at greater risk for substance use, experimentation, and later dependence and abuse. They need immediate help. The treatment of ADHD, this is the next section in this article. And remember, this is from the government's website. The treatment of ADHD... The medications that seem to be most effective are a class of drugs known as stimulants. Following is a list of the stimulants, their trade or brand names, and their generic names. Approved age means that the drug has been tested and found safe and effective in children of that age. Adderall. Generic name, amphetamine. Three years and older. You listen to this? Concerta. Methylphenidate. Six and older. Silert. Pemeline. Six and older. Dexedrine. Dextroamphetamine, three and older. Dextrostat, dextroamphetamine, three and older. And I'm not going to read the whole, it's a very long list. Ritalin, methylphenidate, six and older. Ritalin SR, Ritalin LA, on and on. Listen to this. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration recently approved a medication for ADHD that is not a stimulant. Okay, so basically what they're saying is 99% of the drugs that they give to kids with ADHD are stimulants. This new drug, Stratera, works on the neurotransmitter nor epinephedrine, listen to this, whereas the stimulants primarily work on dopamine, 
period. Now, did that word sound familiar to you, dopamine? Have you ever heard of somebody taking dope? People being a dope head? You know where that word comes from? Dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical that's released in your body. And I want, I want you to understand this. And you say, why are you preaching all this? Look, I'll get to the Bible. Hold your horses. I use more Bible than any church that I've ever been to, okay? Let me rant and rave for a little while first. <laughs> the stimulants work primarily on dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical that's released in your body that goes to what's called the reward center of your brain, okay? If you smoke marijuana, if you snort cocaine, if you take uh, morphine, if you take uh, Vicodin, if you take codeine, if you take morphine injections, if you take uh, heroin, is another extreme example of this, these go to the reward center of your brain and make you feel high. They make you feel good. That's why it's called dope. That's why people who take it are called dope heads. Okay? This is what Ritalin is working on. This is the premise that these stimulants are working on. They're going to the neurological reward center of the brain and releasing chemicals in their body exactly the same as taking street drugs. That's what it is. It's the same stuff. By their own admission. Listen to this. Off-label use. Sometimes the doctor may... Bes- now remember, all of these were, were set up to start at age 6, except a few that were at age 3 and older. Ritalin starts at age 6. Sometimes the doctor may prescribe for a young child a medication that has been approved by the FDA for use in adults or children. This use of the medication is called off-label. Many of the newer medications that are proving helpful for child mental disorders are prescribed off-label because only a few of them have been systematically studied for safety and efficacy in children. Medications that have not undergone such testing are dispensed with the statement, safety and efficacy have not been established in pediatric patients. You say, what does that mean, Pastor Anderson? This is what it means. They give it to children that are under six all the time. And it's totally legal for them to give it to kids that are under six. They just have to hand them a statement that says, it's never been tested. Here you go. Even though it technically is not supposed to start till age six, they do it all the time. Let me read you one more thing before I get into the sermon. Physicians concerned about Ritalin being forced on school children by Linda Kirk, MA, LPC, BCIA, CQE. These are all her degrees. Okay, I'm not going to read it all, all these letters. It's like the whole alphabet. Okay. <laughs> this woman is a physician who has a lot of credibility, apparently. Dare to say no to drugs. How many times have you seen the familiar black t-shirt with the red logo on our elementary school kids? I've always smiled as I thought, I'm so glad to see that we're educating our kids about drugs at this crucial age. Now I shake my head in disbelief and wonder at the irony as I read the the recent chilling report of the Journal of the American Medical Association that the use of Ritalin and other psychotropic drugs... I don't know if you know what that word means. I've studied that word psychotropic. It's it's like LSD. (laughs) It's considered a psychotropic drug. Uh, it says, other psychotropic drugs has increased two to three fold in the years 1991 to 1995 among two to four year olds. Okay? The package insert for Ritalin, however, states Ritalin should not be used in children under six years old since safety and efficacy in this age group has not been established. The JAMA article was not the first critique of Ritalin treatment for the attention deficit disorder. As early as 1973, the U.S. Congress began holding hearings on the overuse of stimulant drugs in our nation's schools. Twenty-five years ago, there were over 200,000 children using Ritalin and other amphetamines to treat ADHD. Ironically, today in our public schools, which are being promoted as drug-free zones, many of our students are routinely being given legal, mind-altering drugs. Today's current estimates are that in excess of 6 million children are taking Ritalin on a daily basis. Did you hear that? Now remember, at the beginning of their website, how many kids did they say were estimated have ADHD? 2 million. Now on the same page, I didn't even click to a different website. This is the same page. You know, link me over to this. Now they're saying 6 million children are taking Ritalin on a daily basis. It says here, nearly 90% of all Ritalin sales worldwide are in the United States. Did you know that kids are forced on Ritalin in public school? Did did you hear the title of the article? Physicians concerned about Ritalin being forced on school children. Can you believe that? Forcing a psychotropic drug, forcing a mind-altering drug on a child that's two to four years old, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine years old. Why? Because they run around uncontrolled. Why? Because they can't sit still and pay attention. Why? Because they're running around and wild and out of control and they're naughty and they're disobedient and they've got a defiance disorder where somebody tells them to do something and they say, no, I'm not going to do it. What are you going to do about it? So let's force them on dope. Let me give you... I think about the world that we're living in. Isn't that amazing? That's the United States of America. Let me give you the three causes that I see the real causes of what we would call ADHD, which does not exist. I'll say it point blank, out in the open. ADHD does not exist, period. That is a just unequivocal statement. I'm not putting any disclaimer with that. There is no such thing as ADD. It's a lie out of hell to force kids on dope. You know, when I was a kid, I would have been put on that. I was a wild kid. My kids are wild. Have you been to my house and watched my kids in the backyard? They run around out of control. They're wild. Now, they're sitting still in church this morning. But they are the wildest kids I've ever known in my life. I mean, (laughs) when I was a kid, I was wild. You know, I was talking talking to uh, Scott Carpenter. You know, I was over there in Ohio. And this is what he said about ADHD. He said, when I was young... They used to just call that being a hard, that guy's a hard worker. You know, these people who have all this energy and run around and stuff. Because they said, as soon as that guy would get hired at a job, he was working really fast and would work hard and everything. They used to call it being a hard worker, where I came from. I like that. And I remember when I was a kid, I was wild. I was out of control. I had a lot of energy. That's why I'm a leader right now. Okay? Because kids sometimes that are a little bit wild, they don't just take... Every brainless thing that they're taught in the public school system, uh, the public school system, I'm sorry, uh, they don't just mindlessly receive everything that's put to them on a TV screen. They think outside the box the government wants to dope them up so that they won't do anything, so that they'll just mindlessly fall in line and mindlessly listen to what they're being taught in that public school system. I'm going to tell you something. If there were two, before I get into the message, I'm still in the introduction. If there were two institutions that I would control in this country, if you wanted to run this country, two things you control. Is it the House of Representatives and the Senate? No. Is it the White House and the Governor's Mansion? No. It would be two things. It would be the public school system and the media. If you control the public school system and the media, you would control the minds of the United States of America. And the public school system and the media are both controlled by radical liberals and homosexuals. That's a fact. Number one cause for ADHD which doesn't exist, but what is known as ADHD, is, number one, a lack of biblical discipline, which is spanking. Look in the Bible. Are you still in the book of Proverbs? Flip over, if you would, to chapter number 23. You're in chapter 22. We saw that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. I I think probably more than 3 to 5% kids have ADHD. I think it's probably more like 90% of kids have ADHD that I've known. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, period. That's what God says. But the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Well, in our day, when people are compromising the Bible, trying to pervert and change what the Bible says, I've been increasingly confronted with people who said, when the Bible talks about sparing the rod and the rod of correction, it's not talking about spanking, it's talking about the shepherd's rod. And the shepherd, he had this big cane with a little hook on the end of it, and and he would take the sheep and pull it in the right way and lead it. And the rod was just a tool he used for leading. Well, let's see what. Let's look at a more unequivocal verse here. Uh, chapter 23, verse 13. The Bible reads, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod... Hey, it may, maybe it does have a hook on the end of it. I don't know. But whatever it is, pick it up and beat the child with the rod. That's what the Bible says. It says, uh, if beat him with the rod, he shall not die. Look at verse 14. Thou shalt beat. Put that, you have the Ten Commandments on the wall in your house. Add number 11. Underneath, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet. Take a pencil and write it. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. The eleventh commandment, my friend, thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Look, if you would, at verse number uh, 24, chapter 13. Go back to chapter 13 in Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 24, the Bible reads, He that spareth his rod... Listen to the strong language that God uses here. Proverbs 23... I'm sorry, Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod... Hateth his son. 
Did you hear that? He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. The word betimes means early. Look it up in the dictionary. It has one definition, early. He that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. You see, if you love your child, you say, that's spanking is abuse. God says if you love your child, you're going to beat your child. If you hate your child, you'll let them do whatever they want. If you hate your child, you'll force them on dope, is what he's saying. If you love the child, spank the child. Now, a lot of people, you say, why does God keep using the word beat? I mean, beat him with the rod? Now, in 2007, when we hear the word beat, you know, we think of somebody taking their fist and bam, you know. That's not what God's saying. God's not talking about a baseball bat like we would think of a beating. But at the same time, I don't think we should ever change the Bible. Should we ever change what God's... We shouldn't change it. Well, what he means is spank. That's not what he said. He said beat. Okay. Now, he doesn't mean a beating like with your fist or with a baseball bat. He said beat him with the rod. I believe that God has designed a place on the human body to receive the beating. Okay. He put extra padding there so that a child can receive the beating in this particular area. I don't believe in hitting your kids and pummeling them. Use the area that God designed for the beating. Now, look. Tell me, if this, tell me if you would describe this as a beating, okay? No, no, Johnny. Now, does that sound like a beating to you? No. This is the way most people spank their kids. This is the way most Christians spank their kids. I can't even feel that. I mean, I, literally. And, and you, you say, why are you being like... Look, I have to break it down because a lot of people don't understand what I'm talking about. So I'm trying to be, make it very clear and very simple for people. Because a lot of people think that this is spanking... Come here, son. Come on up here, Isaac. Look at this. Did that hurt? No. He does, he's smiling. He's happy. He likes it. Okay, look. Hey, a little, pat, a little pat on the behind is not biblical discipline. It's not a real spanking. It's worthless. It's a joke. Have you ever seen parents spank their kids and then the kid smiles at them and laughs in their face? I've seen it many times. When I spank my kids, they're never laughing and they're never smiling. When I was spanked growing up, no, I didn't smile for a few hours <laughs> when I was growing up, the kind of spankings that I got. Okay? That is not a spanking. This is not a spanking. A little pat on the behind. You're wait, look, I've seen parents who spank their kids 25 times in one day. If you're spanking your kid 25 times, what? Well, you know, maybe when you just start spanking, you might have to do that. But if you're spanking your kids perennially 25 times a day, 15 times a day, you're doing something wrong. Because if you spank them correctly, it should last a little while. I mean, when I got spanked, when I was, when, you know, I got spanked by my mom growing up a lot. But when my dad spanked me, I was good for days. I mean, for days, I was just, I remember just thinking, what must I do? <laughs> what do I have to do? Lord, what will they have me to do? Just every, I just wanted to be perfect for a couple days because I dreaded and feared the next spanking. Okay, but even my mom's spankings, I feared my mom's spankings enough to where I said, I better not do this because I don't want that spanking. Let me show you the right kind of spanking. Okay, this is called a belt. Okay, this is made out of leather. This is something that I have with me every day all the time. I never don't have a belt. I always wear a belt. Okay? Well, sometimes when my kids act up, I take off my belt. And I take my belt and I fold it in half like this. And I hold the buckle in one hand and the other end of the belt in the other hand. And this is how I spank my kids like this. Okay? That is a real spanking. Now, I'm not going to demonstrate it on Isaac because he's being a good boy right now. There's a big difference. No, I'm not going to spank him or the audience either. <laughs> Look, the reason I'm illustrating this to you is because you have to spank a, a spanking. The goal is never to injure your child. God never says he wants you to injure your child. I don't injure my children. But the goal is to inflict pain. That's the whole point of a spanking. Not injury. You don't want them to be injured, but you want them to feel a sharp, stinging sensation of pain. Now, this is going to save them from the pain that they're going to feel their whole life from living the life of sin. From living the life of debauchery, living the life of no rules. Who's, who's heard about this Paris Hilton thing, right? It's in the news every day, right? It's on the cover. I don't have, I don't have a TV. I don't listen to this. But just, you can't help but see it just on every newspaper. And I see it every time I turn on the internet and the news stories come up. You know, Paris Hilton throwing a temper tantrum in the courtroom. It's not fair! It's not right! And they dragged her out and she screamed out, It's just not fair! It's just not right! 
She's out driving drunk. She gets probation. She's violating the probation. She's driving drunk again and again. Finally, they put her in jail for 45 days. And this is the first time that she's ever been told no in her whole life. This is the first time she's ever seen a boundary. And many kids, I talked to a corrections officer, I think it was when we were out sewing, we were talking to a corrections officer, he said, these kids go through their whole life and they never find a boundary. Nobody ever tells them no. Nobody ever punishes them for what they've done. And the first time in their life they find a boundary is when they're 14 years old and the policeman finally shows them a boundary and says no, and they end up going to jail and actually getting some real punishment. It's the first punishment they've had in their whole life because mom and dad didn't correct them. You say it's abusive to spank your kids. Hey, it's abusive not to spank your kids because you're destroying their life. You're setting them up for a life of pain and misery and heartache. Hey, the Bible says the way of transgressors is hard. Living, uh, have, you ever heard, have you ever heard somebody say about a, a woman, they say, well, she looks like she's lived a hard life. You ever heard somebody make that statement? Hey, the way of transgressors is hard. The sinful, uh, ungodly lifestyle of a person who has no boundaries, no right and wrong, they've never been punished for what they've done. Hey, it's a hard life. I don't want my kids to go down that hard road. I want them to go down the life of blessing and, and life and joy and peace. So I'm going to spank them with the bell. Yes! Why? Because I want them to grow up and love God and live a happy life. And I thank God that I'm standing here. I'm 25 years old. I thank God for every time I was spanked growing up. Every time my mom and dad spanked me, I praise the Lord for it. Why? Because that was a time when they said, I love you. That's what it was. Every time my parents spanked me, I measured the love that my parents had for me by how many spankings I got growing up. That's how I measure the love. Your mom loved you a lot, didn't she? <laughs> I could tell by your face. <laughs> oh, some of us have been more loved than others in life. And so, spanking, God says, is a sign of love. Spanking, he said, let me use a word, just because I know you're going to be a pansy about it, let me just use the word beat. Beat him with the rod. Thou shalt beat. Boy, that judge, remember that judge that got thrown out for having the Ten Commandments? He should have had that on the wall. Thou shalt beat. Then he really would have got kicked out fast. The Bible says on and on throughout the Bible, you know, he that spareth his rod, hated his son. Spare the rod, spoil the child. You've heard people say that. What's it mean to spoil? It means to ruin them, to destroy them. You know, attention deficit disorder... And I, I want to tell you another thing quickly before I move on from that point. Look at chapter 22 again. And look at verse number... You know, I'm having trouble finding the verse. I'll just quote it to you. Oh, no, here it is. I'm sorry. Verse, chapter 29, verse 15. Sorry about that. Chapter 29, verse 15, the Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. What's reproof? Reproof is when you say no. That's what reproof means. Reproving someone is when they do something and you say, No, you're wrong change. It says, the, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. It's funny, my wife is from Germany. When she first came to the United States and she heard about attention deficit disorder, ADD, this is what she thought it meant. She thought it meant that the kid is not getting enough attention. You know, when in reality, they mean that the kid can't pay attention. You know, he can't stay focused, he wants to run around and play like a normal kid. Uh, she thought it meant attention deficit, like he's suffering from an attention deficit. People aren't spending time with him. And people laughed at her and said, that's an idiot, silly, you know, that's all it means. But really, that is what it is. You know, the parents aren't spending the time with the child. They don't, they're too lazy to take the time to discipline and beat the child. They're, they're, they're not taking the time to train up the child, to spend time with the child, to sit down and explain things to the child, to teach the child right and wrong, to bring the child to church. You say, why should I come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? So that you can have your, so your kids will be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? That's a pretty good reason. Because every time you lay out at church, the kids aren't in church. And so, get your kids to church. Hey, take the time to teach them and to train them yourself. Don't rely on church. Hey, take the time to spank your children. Take the time to be with your children. A child left to himself who has an attention deficit is going to bring his mother to shame. So, number one reason I see uh, attention deficit disorder is, number one, it's a lack of biblical discipline. It's, it's timeouts. We never use timeouts, ever. We never ground our kids. I'm never going to ground them as teenagers. I was never grounded growing up. My parents never grounded me. All the other kids around us were getting grounded. Never got grounded one time. I didn't even know what it meant to be grounded. 
I mean, I, it never happened. It was just always a spanking. It was always God's method of discipline in my house when I was growing up. That's the way it is in my house. No timeouts, no groundation, biblical discipline. Spankings, spank them, and then you know what? I don't bring it up to them. I don't say, I'm mad at you. I don't get angry. I don't yell at them. I just spank them, and five seconds later, I'm smiling and everything's fine. And we can move on. That's Bible discipline. Take care of the problem and be done with it. Don't hold a grudge. Don't yell. Don't be angry. But just deal with the problem. Discipline them. Move on. But number two. Here's the number, the number two reason why attention deficit disorder affects so many children. Number one was lack of biblical discipline. Number two, overstimulation by television, movies, video games, rock music, flashing images, etc. That's part of the problem. You wonder why kids can't sit still in church. You wonder why kids can't sit still in front of a book. You wonder why kids can't behave and listen in school. You wonder why kids run around and act like a monster and act like an animal. I'll tell you why. Because they're constantly overstimulated by all the flashing images. Have you ever turned on one of these uh, child cartoon stations? It's unbelievable. The flashing images changing every two or three seconds. All the bright colors, all the loud noises, and everything is just loud, 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 loud. You say, stop it, you're annoying me. Hey, it's annoying, these shows. That's, exa- that's what I'm talking about. Here, let me demonstrate overstimulation. Let me overstimulate you. You want to listen to that all day? That's what their music's like? That's what their TV is like? Hey, I only expect you to listen to screaming three times a week for an hour. Hey, they listen to it all day long. Their music is screaming, beating drums, loud, rambunctious music. They go to the gas station, it's loud music. They go to school. I remember on the public school playground, they blasted rock music when I was a kid. Lunchtime, blasting rock music. Watch the TV, it's flashing images, explosions, blah, blah, blah. Overstimulation. Flashing images. This is what the Bible says. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. You know, many times God speaks in a still, small voice, the Bible says. But we live in a society that just overstimulates your senses all the time. You wonder why a child can't sit down and read a book with white pages and black ink is because all they're ever used to is bright colors, flashing, loud, extreme everything. That's why they don't know how to be quiet. That's not why they don't know how to sit down. The Bible says in Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of Him, talking about God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. God says you can look at the natural world, you can look at God's creation, and you can learn something about God. You can go out into the forest, you can go out into the desert, you can go to the ocean and sit down and quietly contemplate and look around, look up at the stars, look at the nature, and God says you will learn something about God. Isn't that what the Bible said? It says that His power and His Godhead are understood by the things that are made. Where in nature do you find these kind of loud, extreme, flashing... Why? You know, you try to take these kids that have ADHD, try and take them to the zoo. They can't just sit and look at the animals and enjoy it. They can't just go to the aquarium and just look at the fish and just walk around and enjoy the nature. They can't just go on a long drive and look out the window and see and enjoy the natural world. Why? Because they're so blasted, their senses, all the time with loud noises... Flashing images, they're overstimulated. That's why they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. What they need, what mom and dad need to do, number one, spank. Number two, turn off the TV, turn off the wild music, sit down and read with their kids, take their kids on a walk. You say, well, that's work. It's work, yes, that's why people don't do it, because they're lazy. Take them on a walk. Take them to the nature park. Take them to the zoo. Take them to the aquarium. Hey, take them somewhere where they can see something and learn something about God. Where they can learn to be still and know that I am God, as God said. But not only that, number three. First, we saw lack of biblical discipline. Number two, we saw overstimulation by TV, movies, video games, rock music, flashing images. And let me say something about video games. Do I think it's a sin to play Pac-Man? I don't. I do think it's a sin to watch what's on TV because of the ungodliness. But I'll tell you something. I don't think that Millipede is a sin. I don't think Mrs. Pac-Man is a sin. I don't think that, you know, uh, 
a missile command is a sin. I know I'm talking about the really old games, because some of the games nowadays are a sin, okay? So I'm having to go back to the good, clean games of Pac-Man, Mrs. Pac-Man, Eat and Run, right? You remember these? Millipede, Centipede, Missile Command, uh, come on, Pole Position, right? Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, you're just driving on the road and stuff like that. I was at a, a pizza place in, in Los Angeles with my son Solomon. We stopped and went to my favorite pizza place in the world, Round Table Pizza. It's only in California, though. Really good pizza. Round Table Pizza, it's the, there's nothing like it. I've searched and tried to find something here that's like it. It doesn't exist. There's one in Arizona. It's in Yuma. Okay? It's the only Round Table in Arizona of all places. Well, we sat down at Round Table Pizza. We ate some pizza together. And it was just me and Solomon. And I looked over, and there were video games. And one of the video games was Pole Position. No, nothing bad. I mean, it's just a road and a car. And drive. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe I'll just let Solomon. He would really enjoy sitting down and playing some Pole Position. You know, I grew up playing it. But, you know, I didn't have him play it. Now, would it be a sin to play Pole Position? No. Would I like to go over and sit down and play Pole Position? I could have played it for hours. Okay, I, I used to love video games growing up. But there's a reason why I never play video games. Never, 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 never. My kids have never played video games. There's a reason why. Because I'm just trying to teach them not to just sit down and stare at a screen all day and boom, 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 boom. Because video games are too fun. They're too fun. They suck you in and you waste your life in front of a computer screen. And I don't want my kids to get all overstimulated where everything is about racing a car all the time, uh, blowing things up all the time, just wild, flashing, loud images. I'm trying to teach them to understand that you don't have to have all that to have fun. My kids know how to have fun by playing outside, by running around, by swinging on the swing set, by looking at nature, by doing things that are productive and right and clean. I don't want to even introduce them into the world of video games. Not everything has to be just, well, is it a sin or not? Is it wrong or not? I don't go through life wondering whether things are a sin or not. I don't sit there and ask myself before I do something, hmm, is this a sin or technically am I allowed to do this? No. I go through my life trying to be the best that I can be. Not trying to be as close to the line of what's wrong. I try to go through life saying, what would be the best thing for me to do right now? Not, what clothing can I wear that's not wrong, that's not a sin. I, I think, what's the best possible clothing that I can wear right now? What's the best activity I can do with my son? Not just what's not a sin, not what would God approve of, but what would God think is the greatest thing for me to do. That's the way you've got to go through life. And so, just because it's not a sin doesn't mean that I want to do it. Paul said, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but all things edify not. And so that's why I just wanted to bring that up about overstimulation. Part of the reason why my kids can sit still and behave is because I don't let them watch all this loud, boisterous stuff, all the flashing and rah, rah, rah all the time. I teach them to enjoy things that are a little more normal than that. But number three, I think that the problem with why we have so much ADHD is that church and school programs cater to a short attention span. They've thrown up their hands, the school, the church, has thrown up their hands and said, well, and I've heard it said, I heard it in Bible college, I heard it in churches my whole life, well, these kids, I mean, they watch the TV all day, they listen to rock music all day, that's what we're competing with, so we got to be just as wild, just as loud, just as flashy for these kids, because that's what we're competing with. And so you get on the bus, and it's just, ah, you know, the music... Don't sing the old hymns in the junior church. What do they do? They sing the wild, loud, Somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for them who trust Him and obey. False doctrine, by the way. Trust Him and obey or believe on Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus will come again, and though we don't know when, the countdown's getting lower every day. Ten and nine, eight and seven. You say, is that a bad song? I'm not saying that these kids' songs are necessarily bad songs. But what we've done in our churches is we've catered, we've dumbed down the service for kids. My kids are right now in an adult preaching service, right? They're sitting in the front row. They're listening to every word I'm saying. I'll guarantee you they are learning a lot more than if they were in some little kid's class somewhere. You say, why don't you have Sunday school class for kids? Is it because you're too small? Because we don't have the laborers, we don't have the workers to do it? That's not why. We will never have Sunday school classes for kids in this church. You say, oh. We will never have Sunday school classes for kids in this church. 
Our kids will always be listening to preaching by a preacher. Adult uh, preaching by a man who's preaching like a preacher, not some little dumbed down Sunday school class. Now, don't, don't get offended with what I'm going to say right now. But the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Let me illustrate something to you. And I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way when I explain this to you. I'm not saying that the Sunday school classes are bad, or that the kids' songs are bad, or that the, the junior church is bad and horrible. But let me just illustrate to you something. I just want to open your mind to something. Can you just think about this, if I put this out there for you? But you know, in the 1960s, when we had the children's Sunday school big movement, and all these big Sunday school programs came out back in the 1960s. All the children who went to those classes, they didn't get preaching like you're getting right now. This preaching is not geared toward children, is it? Are any of my messages geared toward children? No, I mean, it's just Bible preaching. I mean, a child could definitely profit from the things I'm preaching. But it's just Bible preaching. Is the music program here at Faithful Word Baptist Church geared toward children? No, it's the hymns out of the hymn book. But when you have, in the 1960s, you have all these uh, children's churches and junior churches and Sunday school and take the kids out of the service, put the babies in the nursery, put the kids in the children's class. Well, what do you have? A bunch of wild music like I brought up. Well, what do, they, what do those kids, now that they're adults, what do they want? What did that generation want that grew up in the 1960s? Well, what does 99% of churches in America in 2007 have? Wild, loud, flashing music. Isn't that the truth? Go to the average Baptist church. Go to the average community church. It's all the loud, radical music. The music at the liberal church is more similar to what was going on in the Sunday school 40 years ago than it was to what was going on in the adult service 40 years ago when they were singing the same songs that we sung this morning. Think about the short sermon. In the kids' classes, they always had a shorter sermon. And I know what I'm talking about because before I started this church, you know what I was doing uh, two months before I started this church? I was teaching a class of kids ages 7 through 10 for three years straight every Sunday. Inner city kids from the worst ghetto in America, the murder capital of America, Chicago, I had a class. Sometimes I had 41 kids in my class. With I was the only person running the class. Me in a room with 41 kids lined up. And I had to teach that class for how long? Two hours I had to teach these kids for. Because that's how long the Sunday school and the adult service was. I had them for the whole time. Two hours. Can you imagine entertaining and preaching to 41 kids from the inner city who've never been disciplined for two hours every Sunday? It was painful. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> now, I got, I got very good at it. Okay, I had to get good at it. My life depended on it. Okay, I had to survive. And usually I averaged about 20 kids in the class. 41 is, was the highest. We had that twice. Usually I had about 20 kids in the class, truth be told. It was about 20. Sometimes it was as low as maybe like 10 or 12, as high as 40. But it, right about 20 was pretty consistent with that. And so I, know, I understand these things. I know what's going on. And people say, you've got to preach a short little sermon because you're going to lose their interest fast. So what do they do? They go to a Sunday school program where they have loud, wild music. A short sermon, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Usually the teacher's a woman. Isn't that the truth in Sunday school classes? If you go to most churches, the Sunday schools are being taught by women. Okay. Now, at, also, the sermons are usually all positive. Usually they don't get up and scream and yell and rip face in some Sunday school class. Usually it's like, now boys and girls, you know, Noah got on the ark. You know, story about Noah's ark. None of it's about God destroying the whole world and killing everybody. You know, when you learn about Noah's ark in Sunday school, it's all about the animals, right? It's all about the animals getting on the ark two by two. And then they float around, and then they get off the ark. Nothing about, nothing about the other, you know, millions of people that died in the flood. It's just an all-positive version. If you learn about Adam and Eve, it's all about naming the animals. You, know, you learn about uh, any story, it's toned down, it's changed, it's mellowed out. So it's an all-positive sermon. Just tell me if this sounds familiar to you. All-positive, 20-minute sermon, loud, boisterous music, and a female teacher. You can find that at any United Methodist Church this morning. You can find that at the community church. 
You can find that at the big liberal charismatic church. You can find that at the Assemblies of God church. You'll find that all over this area. Why? Because those kids were programmed that way when they were little, and when they train up a child in the way he shouldn't go, when he's old, he's going to go the wrong way. And so, why do you think that back in the old days, big independent Baptist churches had three, four, five, six thousand people? It was very common. Churches that had hard preaching, old-fashioned music, yelling and preaching, and, and straight down the line, and point out the sin. Boy, it was every, every city in America had a lot of churches like that. Big churches like that. But what happened is, they sold their youth a different brand of Christianity... And when the kids grow up, they go to that brand of Christianity. They go to hear Joyce Meyer, the woman preacher. They go to a church where the pastor's a woman. They go to the church where the sermon lasts for 20 minutes long. They go to the church where it's all about the music, and the music's loud and funky. Hey, they go to the church that's like what they grew up with as a little tiny kid, because that's what their idea of church is. If my children don't understand a word that I'm saying right now, which is ridiculous, because they understand every word I'm saying right now, but let's say they didn't understand a word that I said, Let's say my uh, baby in the front row, my four-month-old Miriam, doesn't understand what I'm saying right now. She's learning one thing. She's learning what church is. She's learning the church is the old hymns. She's learning the church is a man who stands up like a man and preaches the Bible without apology that thunders forth and shouts out the Word of God. She's learning what church is. She's not getting a soft soap, soft sale sermon by some Sunday school mom. She's getting a real preaching service, and when she grows up, I promise you, she will be at a preaching service when she's 25 years old. I promise you. She, you think she's going to go to some limp-wristed, sissified uh, Baptist church? Do you think she's going to go to one of these churches where you're not even sure whether the pastor is even straight, or whether he's a queer? No. She's going to go to a church where the pastor's a man. She's going to go to a church where the music is God's kind of music. She's going to go to a church where the sermon has substance and content from the Bible. It's not just a feel-good, all-positive sermon. Listen to this. Let me illustrate this for you. This was in the June 2006 issue of the North Valley Newsletter from North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara. There's a piece in this newsletter, and this came to me, this newsletter. You know, you get on these people's mailing list somehow, and they send you stuff all day long. How to Lead Children to Christ. This is from uh, North Valley Baptist Church of Santa Clara, California. How to Lead Children to Christ. And it goes through the different points of how to win a child to the Lord. This is point two. Point two. Sin must be punished, for the wages of sin is death. Explain hell. Refrain from using frightening, offensive descriptions of punishment and hell. So if you describe the punishment and hell according to this man, you're being offensive. This is the guy who runs Junior Church at, at Treber's Church up in Santa Clara. It says, uh, refrain from using frightening, offensive descriptions of punishment and hell. Parentheses, these are children after all. I can just hear his faggot voice saying it that way. These are children. Ugh. Ugh. Come on. These are children, you know. You oh, you dasn't mention hell and fire. Oh, shit. This guy needs a beating. Or put him on Ritalin or do something with him. <laughs> Explain hell. Refrain from using frightening, offensive descriptions of punishment in hell. These are children, you know. Instead, focus on the worst part about hell. What? So don't talk about the punishment and offensive, uh, frightening. Don't talk about anything scary. Talk about the worst part. Now look, if I were talking about the worst part, that seems like it would be the scariest part. Like all the fire. Like you're going to be there forever? That sounds very scary, but listen to what he says. Uh, instead, focus on the worst part about hell, because you don't want to scare him. Like, what sense does that even make? Focus on the worst part, because you don't want to scare him. You don't want to offend him. And he says, focus on the worst part about hell, being separated from God. <laughs> I mean, come on. The Bible says that, that God's in hell. That's what the Bible says. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. It says they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. It says that they shall be tormented day and night with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Clear violation of Bible teaching to even teach that hell is separation from God when Jesus Christ is the one punishing you in hell. He's the one who made the place. He's the one who's there tormenting. 
Focus on the worst part. So don't talk about anything offensive about it like Jesus did. You dads not talk about it like the Bible did, about the screaming, the gnashing of teeth, the fire and brimstone, and the pain and torment and destruction. Just focus on the worst part. Uh, separation from God. This is what I'm talking about. You think the kids who grow up in, in, uh, in uh, Sunday school teacher sodomites class, you think that they're going to grow up and you think that they're going to go to a hellfire, breathe in damnation Baptist church? No, they're not. They're going to go to some sissified... And some of you don't like the way that I'm preaching right now. You belong at sissified Baptist church down the street. You belong at queer little sissy Baptist church. This is a Baptist church where you're going to hear the Bible preach. You say, I don't appreciate the way you call names. Hey, I don't appreciate the way that our country is going to hell. I don't appreciate the fact that six million kids are on dope right now. Huh? That makes me mad. Doesn't that make you mad? Huh? Does it make you mad to know that six million kids are being forced on drugs in our public schools right now? Because that makes me mad. Does it make you mad that those kids are going to grow up and even by the government's own admission are going to thieve and rob and steal? Isn't that what it said they do? Remember, they've got CD and ODD. They're going to steal. They're going to break into your house. They're going to hurt your family. They're going to break your things. They're going to lie to you. They're going to do everything to hurt you and destroy America, destroy your family, destroy churches. They're already doing it. Wake up and smell the coffee. You want me to get up and preach to you right now about love thy neighbor as thyself? You want me to get up and preach a 51-week series on tithing right now? When our country is being destroyed around us? When our youth is being forced on dope and nobody cares? When 3,000 babies are being aborted every day, nobody cares? When I can't go to a gas station without some filthy sodomite, flaming queer, standing behind me in line like happened to me yesterday at the gas station? Wiggling his stupid little booty in the gas station, huh? And nobody says a word to him. Nobody has the guts to say anything to him. You know what? I say something to him when I'm in public. And you know what? If everybody did, they'd be back in the closet. If everybody treated him like I treat him, they'd be back in the closet, my friend. You think I let him just wiggle his little booty in front of me and limp his wrist in front of me and not say anything? No, that's what you do. That's what the United States does, and that's why they're taking over the airwaves. That's why they've already taken over the public school. You say, why? where's all the anger from? Hey, the Bible says God's angry with the wicked every day. The anger is from the stories that I heard this week from people that I love that were abused and harmed by people like this. That's where the anger is from. The anger comes from love for the victims. The anger comes from love of America and what America used to be. Huh? The anger comes from a love for kids, for love of my own family, for the desire that my kids would have an America to grow up in where everybody's not on drugs and everybody's not a pedophile and a sodomite. Now, if you don't like this kind of preaching, nobody's forcing you to be here right now. You can just uh, scoot your little uh, booty out of this church and go to that queer little sissy church and sit next to him. But I'm going to tell you something. This church isn't changing! People try to change this church. People try to intimidate me and tell me what they don't like about this church. Tell me what you don't like about this church all day long. This church is going to be the lone voice in the wilderness, the voice crying in the wilderness, that will cry out against the queers in this country. Yes, it will. They will cry out against the dope dealing in this country by the federal government and by the public school system and by the pharmaceutical companies. Yes, it will. I'm not going to turn a blind eye and watch my country go down to hell without a fight. And so that's where the anger comes from. My anger is directed toward the independent Baptist who won't stand up and tell somebody not even to preach like I'm preaching, but good night, can he at least preach about hell? I mean, one of the most basic doctrines of the Bible? I mean, can he at least preach about salvation? I mean, good night. Can he at least teach kids the real songs out of the hymn book? Instead of his little dumbed down, sugar-coated little service? And so I'm going to tell you something. The reason why ADD runs rampant is because, number one, no biblical discipline of children. Number two, it's because of all the flashing, wild images. It's because of all the overstimulation 24 hours a day, watching the television, playing the video games, looking at the bright, colorful magazine, and number three, it's because of a school system and a, a churches who dumb down their service for little kids. They make a special service where they segregate people by age and they put this little kid over here. He never hears real preaching. He never hears the Bible thundered from the pulpit. 
and all he ever hears is some soft-coated little uh, sugar stick message for 15 minutes, and then it's treat time. When I taught those kids up in Chicago, you know what I did? I preached to them like I'm preaching right now. I preached the Bible. I preached like a man. I didn't just get the flannel graph and show a little story. I got up and screamed and yelled and preached to those kids. And they got the message. And I guarantee you, they'll remember the things that they were taught in that class for the rest of their life. And when they grow up to look for a church someday, they'll look for a church where they're actually learning the Bible and hearing the truth preached. Now you say, why do you preach, why do you preach like this, Pastor? And I said, several reasons. Number one, I want my kids to hear the preaching that I'm preaching right now. You say, well, I don't like this kind of preaching. Well, they like it. And they're going to grow up and believe what's right. Number two, the reason I preach this way is to keep the freaks and weirdos out of this church. Anybody's welcome in this church. I want everybody to be here. But you know what? When you preach hard on sin, all the freaks and weirdos leave. We had a guy call us yesterday. There's a guy who's called us like eight times. And he pretends to be asking about our church. He always starts with the same statement. Oh, well, hi, what time are your Sunday services? Well, I figured out he was a little weird because first he's calling on the church number. Then he's calling on the home number. How did he even get my home number, right? He's calling on the home number. Hi, what time are your Sunday services? It's like, well, if you know my home phone number, you probably know what time the service starts since it hasn't changed in the last year and a half. And this guy, you know what he, you know what he keeps asking? So, do you guys have a lot of... I have kids, you know. Do you have a lot of kids in your church? For my kids to play with? How old are they? He asks questions about how old the kids are, how many kids there are. Why? Because he's a pervert. Because he's a pedophile, that's why. I wish you would have been here last Sunday night. You could have heard me preach about that. Maybe if you were here on Wednesday night, you probably heard me preach about it. About what the Bible teaches. I went through every verse of the book of Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2. And I went through biblically and showed you the danger of pedophiles that are out there after your kids. So he's a pedophile. He's calling up. Why? Because he wants to come here. If he were here this morning, he'd never come back. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, ye creatures here below. You say, don't you want everybody to come to church? No. I don't want the freaks and weirdos to come to this church. Did you know that there was a gay guy in our service the first Sunday night that I ever held, December 25th, 2005? And I preached, and I yelled about the sodomites and the queers, and he went, (laughs) So you know what I did? I said the exact same thing again. And then he went like this. The whole rest of the service. Did he come back? Nope. And my kids are safe. My kids will never be defiled by his filthy hands. Why? Because we, we run them off with the truth. We run them off with Bible preaching. And so uh, we nipped it in the bud right there. I called a friend of mine from Bible college and he asked, How'd your first day go? How'd your first Sunday go? I said, Boy, it went great. We had all these visitors Sunday morning, all these visitors Sunday night. And I said, Hey, I learned something. He said, What'd you learn? I learned that you have to preach on the queers every single service, at least once, for even if it's just for ten seconds. Because that keeps it clean. That cleans, it, that cleans house. It keeps them out. Because I said, I already ran one out on my first Sunday. And you know what? I'll be running about 20 years from now. You're not going to change me. Nobody's going to change me. Nobody's going to change this church. If you like this church, hey, you're in luck because it's not going to change. If you don't like it, go choose from all the other compromisers and sissies and wimps out there. And the wimps are the reason why the country's in the state it's in right now. Because nobody will stand up to me. But I stand up to them in public. I stand up to him in the gas station. I stand up to him in the post office. Right, Isaac? He can tell the story about that. Hey, I stand up to him. I don't let these queers push me around. It's time for America to push back. It's time for Bible-believing Christians to start pushing back when they get pushed. I don't walk around with my tail between my legs when they're out with their big t-shirt and their gay pride. And I saw a lesbian in the gas station the other day that said, We are everywhere. And it had a rainbow symbol. We are everywhere. Boy, they're yelling it from the mountaintops. They got the stickers all over their car. They'll make sure that you can tell within five seconds of listening to them talk that they're a homo because they lay it on so thick because they're taking over America. And you think I'm nuts right now? You think I'm a fanatic right now? Come see me in five years. We'll see who's nuts. It won't. That's all it's going to take. Come see me in five years. Sit down with me and say, did you think I was a fanatic? You still think I'm a fanatic? Now that you see the country in the condition it's in right now, you know, when, when our president's going to be some lesbian, you know, a couple of years from now probably. When, when, when's it going to be too far? That's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering 
when people are going to just say enough in this country. It's too far. If they're not doing it when they're killing the unborn at 3,000 a day, if they're not doing it when the homos are just rampant, if they're not doing it now, when are they going to do it? They're never going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm ready to stand up and fight this thing because I love kids, because I love my family, because I love my country. Now, ADHD, let me just close the sermon, ADHD does not exist. What exists in this country is a lack of spanking, a lack of loving parents who love their kids enough to discipline them and teach them what's right and spend time with them and give them the attention that they need. What's lacking is uh, legitimate entertainment in this country that doesn't involve things exploding and people being killed and dying every five seconds. What lacks is legitimate entertainment like going for a walk, playing basketball, sitting down and playing a board game, uh, going outside and riding your bike, swinging on the swings. And what's lacking is a church service that says, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such are the kingdom of God. Look, a church that won't put up with a kid crying, my kids act up occasionally in the service. Other people's kids act up sometimes in the service. That doesn't bother me at all. Kids are welcome in this church because they need the preaching more than anybody. They need what's being preached. They need real preaching. Uh, not just, oh, okay, well, you can take this class and teach them. You've been in church for two weeks, go teach them. You're a woman, you're not even a preacher, go ahead and teach them anyway. No. They deserve to hear a man of God who knows the Bible preach the Word of God, just like everybody else should be hearing it. They should be hearing it. If you don't agree with that, you're entitled to your opinion. But I want my kids to hear the right kind of preaching. We love kids in this church. I don't want you to ever get upset at people because their kids act up either. Okay? Because you ought to suffer the little children and put up with it. Because they're important too. And I taught my children. To, I've, I've helped other people that have come to this church and their kids acted up a little bit. I took them aside sometimes and would help teach them. Never criticize. I, I taught them and said, "This is. let me help you. This is how I taught my kids to sit still in church. Get this how I did it. I sit them down. I line them up, and I read them the Bible. My wife sits them down, lines them up, and reads them through the Bible a half hour. And they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're not allowed to move. You know, they're not allowed to talk. They're not allowed to get up. This is training them for church. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we sit our kids down, line them up in a row, and read them the Bible for an hour, for 45 minutes, for 30 minutes, whatever the case may be. We have the belt right there. We have the cooking spoon right there. We have the, the rod right there. Do they act up? Yes. The second they act up, they get a spanking. Pretty soon they learn that they have to sit still and listen. Now they're to the point where we can go a whole time without any spankings. They'll all just sit there. They're listening to the Bible. You're reading the Bible. That's great for you too, doing the reading. Because you're getting the Bible too. They're getting the Bible. And they're learning how to behave in church. I've told that to people... And their kids' behavior in church started to improve. Because they put that into practice at home. It's going to take work. Not drugs. Not psychotropic drugs. Not dope. But it's going to take work by you, the parent, of loving your kids enough to read them the blessed Word of God. The powerful Word of God. So that they can learn to come to church and sit still and know that God is God. Be still and know that I'm God. So that they can sit in church and listen to the still, small voice of God through the Word of God being preached. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for Faithful Word Baptist Church. I'm glad. I don't know about the people that are here. I don't know about everybody feels, but I just praise the Lord that there's a church, Faithful Word Baptist Church, that hasn't pander, doesn't pander to the fundamental popes and liberals, doesn't, fa- doesn't pander to the queers, doesn't pander to, to the federal government and their ADD uh, demonic drug program that they're cramming down the throats of six million kids with Ritalin alone, let alone the other 12 uh, drugs that were listed there. God, help us in this country, Father. Please help the Christians in America to wake up. Help us not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And God, help us not to be naive about what's going on. There's real dangers out there. Help us to stand strong on the Bible. Stand firm on what we believe. And thunder forth. Not be afraid of some child protective service worker to where we're afraid to to spank our kids or preach spanking. When they come to to, to my door, God, I'm going to tell them to go to hell. And so, Father, I just pray that you would give everyone in this church the boldness to stand up for what's right. Spank and discipline their children according to the scriptures. Not abusively, but lovingly in the padded place that God has provided. Please just help us to love our kids enough to put everything else aside and say... Kids are number one in Faithful Word Baptist Church. 
kids are number one in our three services. Kids are number one in our homes and with our time. God, we love you.